I'm Monty Mython, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk. Welcome to Journal Club. So this is a Journal Club special, one of the highlights of the year, the METS trial. Measurement of exercise tolerance before surgery. In the show notes, I put two links in for you. The protocol, which was published in the British medical journal Opel in April 2016. And then the results paper, which was published in The Lancet in June 2018. And by my reading, which we try and capture in the interview that's about to come up, there's a shift from the publication of the protocol to the publication of the results. We try to capture that here. The interview is in two sections, both with Professor Mike Grocott. The first is recorded at the time of presentation of the abstract of the paper at the International Anesthesia Research Society in Chicago. The second section is the results, which is recorded from the studio at 1010 Great West Road in London. Enjoy. Top Med Talk. And I've just caught up with Professor Mike Grocott who is a professor of anaesthesia and critical care at the uh, University of Southampton, a regular on Top Med Talk. Mike, tell us a bit more about the METS trial and why it was needed, why it was thought to be necessary. So the METS uh, study, uh, which was initiated uh, by Brian Cuthbertson originally when he was uh, in Scotland before he went across to Canada, uh, now led by Brian and Dominda uh, and Era, uh, was originally designed as a comparison of different methods of preoperative risk assessment. So in particular, uh, particular cardiac biomarkers, uh, objective evaluation of exercise using cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and then more subjective evaluation of exercise using uh, a particular score, so the Duke Activity Status Index. So just going to interrupt for a second there, Mike. The the markers, now not not everyone's going to know about these markers. We've heard about some of these things. So these are blood tests that are performed to measure the levels of naturally occurring substances in the body that... Change, the levels change if, for example, your heart is failing. Is, is that that's that's absolutely right? So, uh, N-terminal pro BMP, so brain natriuretic peptide, is a uh, substance that, if elevated, uh, gives you an indication that there may be uh, that there's some, there may be some cardiac failure there. So, so, sorry, Mike. So, when we talk about the BNP as we go forward, that's the marker of possible heart failure. Even though it's a brain natriuretic peptide, it's known to go up when the heart is failing. It's a bit like creatinine goes up if the kidneys are failing. Yes, and the, the feeling is that it's a relatively. If, if, you, if the number's low, then you can be reasonably confident that there isn't uh, cardiac injury. If the number is high, then there's, there's a bit of complexity around interpreting what that number means. And and the other thing you mentioned, which we've talked about a lot before, is this cardiopulmonary exercise test, which is bring somebody and put them on a bicycle and do something you see athletes doing. Exactly so. It's it's exercising, uh, well, typically it's on a bike, exercising progressively to maximum exertion, and you measure the uh, oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, and some other variables, uh, and give you a measure which is exactly the same as that which you would measure in elite athletes. So so what I know about a little bit I know about this already is that the literature has suggested, one, that the BNP measure can predict outcomes after major surgery, and there's another camp who may or may not believe that is the best test to do, who think that this objective test of exercise, this CPET test, is a good predictor of outcomes after major surgery. Uh, absolutely so. Um, so, uh, and pati- particularly, there's a, there's a bit of a tension here be- between the kind of North American view where cardiac uh, pathology and cardiac morbidity is considered to be the major driver of uh, post-operative harm uh, and uh, a view outside North America which is is less convinced that that's the case and and so the biomarkers are particularly associated with believed to be particularly associated with cardiac injury whereas the uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing literature has been much more about uh, overall complications and morbidity and, and mortality. So when they've looked at the exercise testing, it's, produ- it's predicted all, all for- bundled all forms of major complications, of which in the literature that we've been involved in collecting in Europe and other people have collected over the decades, it's been the sort of infectious complications, kidney failure, lung failure, have dominated the short-term complications, morbidity, whereas there's a lot of emphasis in the USA literature about heart attacks, that's called myocardial infarction, but in particular this tropin in rise post-operatively badged as MINS. Is, that seems to be part of the evolving story as well. I, I think you're right. Uh, I think it's intriguing, um, uh, separate from METS, if you, if you look at the, um, so the blood pressure studies, so IMPRESS, uh, Emmanuel Foutier's study, uh, obviously not American, French study, 
uh, and, and there's very little evidence of uh, myocardial injury, heart attacks, uh, whereas you look at some of the Daniel Sessler's North American data and, and one of the dominant themes is myocardial injury associated with low blood pressure and it's, it's hard to understand why there would be that difference but it does seem to be reasonably consistent across the literature comparing uh, between the different territories and across the years. And you've done a lot of work in the development with others of the perioperative or the post-operative morbidity score POMS so you collected data on thousands of patients. What were the big players? And that was collected both in the USA, originally at Duke, and in the UK and now around the world. What are the big players? And we have to remember the fact that these are morbid events occurring relatively close to surgery. What are the big, big players in those sets? So to, to backtrack a bit, POM, POMS originally defined uh, from patient interview as what they thought was keeping them in hospital and then, and then set a criteria put against different domains. Uh, what you see in North America or outside of North America when you use the POMS is uh, high levels of gut dysfunction, high levels of renal dysfunction, uh, high levels of infectious complications and um, pulmonary complications, and relatively low levels of uh, cardiac and neurological morbidity. Now, the primary outcome variable for this study, I think, is mortality, is death, and some other composite outcomes. And the literature we see from the worlds that we work in is the expected mortality rate is around the sort of three to five percent level for, for major surgery uh, and obviously it depends on your inclusion criteria for the study but for major surgery uh, short-term mortality so in hospital or 30 day I think typically now we're looking at half to one percent unless you're enriching for a high risk population and then at, at a year which was the second time point that METS looked at you might be looking at uh, double that or a little bit more so two three percent and the incidence of these major morbid events in the short term and the long term from the existing literature a little bit more complicated because it uh, depends how you measure it but but uh, but uh, as a rule of thumb about 10 times the mortality so to go back to METS uh, uh, remind us again why we need the study and then tell us about the study design so this, um, this is a study all about uh risk before surgery, predicting outcome, and then uh, there's obviously a whole, uh, a, whole num- a whole load of areas of interest about what you might do with that information. Uh, and it's essentially a comparison between the cardiac biomarkers we just talked about, cardiopulmonary exercise testing uh, as an objective measure of physical fitness, uh, the Duke Activity Status Index as a, a score that might be able to collect that information more simply. And then uh, we added in very early on uh, the straightforward clinician assessment. So, so what's the end of the bedogram if you like is, is this patient fit or not fit so the people who are less keen on doing whether it's the blood tests or the bicycle tests what they often tell us is that they can spot patients who aren't fit they they do an eyeball test and they ask some questions and they seem to be very confident in their pushback on the more objective tests that they're very capable doctors clinicians nurses and all that nonsense isn't necessary because they're good at this you're absolutely right Um, and that's interestingly based on very little literature there's a little bit of surgical literature looking at at, at that alone so not comparing uh, physician assessment with other measures but there's remarkably little comparing uh, our our subjective assessment with more objective data and the met studies explored all of those elements so tell us uh, a little without giving anything big away a little bit about the numbers that were involved the number of countries involved how long it took to do the trial and any of the challenges that were uh, came across en route. So it's a multi-centre international study of patients undergoing elective major surgery. Uh, the three geographies involved were Canada uh, with uh, Deminder and Brian Cuthbertson, uh, the United Kingdom where Rupert Pierce led uh, that, and then Australia and New Zealand with Paul Miles leading uh, in that territory. Uh, all the patients had an exercise test, had the blood test draw- drawn, uh, had the DARSI and the subjective score, and then they were followed for uh, a year. Uh, the primary outcome was um, mortality or a composite of mortality and, and cardiac injury at 30 days. But we looked at um, we also looked at complications in general. In fact, using the post-operative morbidity survey, uh, and then we looked at everything again at one at one year follow-up. And now the next session is after the paper has been published. I'm in the studio with our US anchor, Desiree Chapel, and we call Mike Rocott to go over the results in detail. I don't 
don't know how what to make of the result of the Met study. I've read that paper now two or three times. I've heard it presented, and the paper says one thing, and the presenters seem to say a different thing. Get, let's have your perspective on it. So I think it's a really interesting, but unfortunately rather complicated study, not least because it's essentially comparing four means of evaluation with four separate outcomes. But if we start, I guess, with the primary outcome, which we can discuss in itself, which is myocardial infarction and death at 30 days, it appears that is associated with the functional risk measure DARSI and not with anything else. But there's a caveat to that, which is that if you look at this notion of net reclassification index, which is the idea, the statistics essentially say, so if I add this new measure into my established model, will it make any difference? Will I attribute risk to different patients? The, the answer appears to be no in relation to DARSI and that primary outcome. Okay, I'm, I'm a little bit lost already. That sounds very clever to me. So DARSI is the Duke, as we've been over, the Duke Activity Status Index. So this is the score that goes from are you bed bound through to I'm playing at Wimbledon. Uh, yeah. And that score has a, in simple terms, the headline, it has a relationship, it is predictive of the primary outcome variable, i.e. the lower the score, the more likely for the primary outcome variable which is, say again? 30-day death or myocardial infarction. Okay, that. And, and that overall, that's very important, but it was rare. Well, it, it was both rare, so, and, and the DARSI was associated with it, but it didn't appear to offer any, any additional predictive benefit. Okay, so that's the is, second it, it sounds you, complex. Yeah, go, go for that again. So, so, then when you, so you do the headline result, very rare outcome variable, but important one. The score relates to it, and that score, as we said, has been in the guidelines for at least 20 years, as far as I can remember, as being yeah. related to cardiac outcomes. So the cardiac outcome, which is rare, it is predictive of it. But then you do this other statistical analysis, and it doesn't add anything. Try and help us understand that. So the notion of the net reclassification index is, if you add in this new information, so in this case, the Darcy score, does it alter how you classify risk for individuals in a particular group? And the basic answer here is that it does not so what's the take home for that what 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 did, i'm going to bring in desiree desiree what are you going to do with that next week <laughs> that's what i was just to ask you mike um tell me practically what uh what i'm going to do because i i don't get much from what you've talked about already so, so i'm not sure you're going to do a lot okay. and although we we as a group of authors concluded in the paper that uh darcy may have additional benefit for uh -huh. predicting these cardiac outcomes uh, I think the may is very much the operative word there. Yeah. It, 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 this is not a convincing uh, slam dunk. So maybe we still do DASI if if we're doing it already. But yeah. what what we can conclude from that is so uh, might help. To take you back then to the bit that you don't really get from the abstract, but I've had from every presentation and discussion I've had so far, it, it seems as though most of the complications are those that are commonly reported, things like pneumonias and infections, uh, readmissions, etc., and the cardiopulmonary exercise testing variables did predict those major complications or were associated with it. Both the cardiopulmonary exercise testing vari variables were both associated with uh, and predicted, and, and actually, to be more precise, it's the VO2 peak. The anaerobic threshold was not; the VO2 peak was. Okay, so the VO2 peak predicted. So that sounds to me, and I know we're prejudiced here, we're biased. But that sounds to me as it reinforces the fact that that is a useful test to predict the complications that are the real significant burden. That would be my perspective on this. Part of this depends on your sort of philosophical bias as to whether overall complications are important or whether the heart is at the centre of everything. OK, well, I'm in the camp whereby I don't want to have a troponitis and I don't want to die, but they're pretty rare. What happens much more commonly, because it makes up 95% of the reported complications, are the other things. Okay. So personally, on behalf of the patients, on behalf of the population, I'm interested in both, but I'm actually a little bit more interested in the CPET result. And when you do this clever extra test, the, the, this twist yeah. to see if it adds anything, wh what happens then? So the answer is yes, in relation to the CPET-derived VO2 peak. Uh, in the prediction of general complications. So it's both associated with and it adds extra value in terms of predicting. Okay. So why can't you get any of that from the abstract? It's partly a product of the peer review process. It's partly a product of the fact that it's difficult to squeeze. It, it's such a big, complex study, it's difficult to squeeze all those answers into, the, uh, into an abstract. Um, there were some comments about CPET 
in the abstract way back when, but they've got lost on the peer review journey. Because it wasn't the stated primary outcome variable? Is that the key bit there? Well, for reasons we can go into if we want to, the primary outcome was a cardiac-focused outcome, okay. and therefore the abstract uh, focused on that. Gotcha. So, remind me what the complication rate was again, overall, the major complications? So, just under 14%. There were 194 major complications out of 1,400 more patients, uh, which, interestingly, e- even if you look at the myocardial injury data, that, that their major complications... Uh, uh, outweigh the MINS, the myocardial injury data. There's right. only about 13% of those. Okay. Have you talked to anyone yet who disagrees with that evaluation of it? No. Okay, so we've got consistency here. Whew. Desiree, but I, haven't, but I, haven't, I haven't been to North America and talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably why we've ended up on the MINS part more than the, uh, yeah. than the CPET part or the uh, other um, outcomes. I, it seems more clear to me after this discussion, you know, what we're, what we're talking about, the differentiation between the two um, and the value of both of those things. So, Great stuff. Mike, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Desiree, any, any last comments or questions, no, Mike? Thanks, thanks for uh, kind of going over the Mets thing again, Mike. I think that clears some things up for us. Great it's stuff. Good. I'm, I'm sure great it, to talk to you both. I'm, yeah. Mike, I'm confident it won't stay clear. <laughs> <laughs> that's <Once> right. <laughs> sure, we'll just talk about it a couple more minutes. And no, we'll once get we get you again. across the pond, I'm sure we'll be back discussing this one again. But thanks a lot, Mike. Well done. Congratulations. Excellent. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading and listening to Top Med Talk. Don't forget to find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even got our own YouTube channel. Whichever your favourite social media feed is, we're bound to be there. Find us. Also, subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. And make sure you go to the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com, and get on board with the email updates. Oh, whilst you're at it as well, I suggest you download our entire back catalogue we're categorizing at the moment we're having a little look through it It may not always be in the form that you currently find it so if you get your hard drive ready for a full-on download via the website perhaps or perhaps through your podcatcher oh and if you fancy meeting us why not go to the website ebpom.org forward slash meetings our next big event is ebpom usa the dallas masters course a perioperative care practicum have a look for details of that and some of the other meetings coming up across the next year. Edpom.org forward slash meetings.